Hello everyone and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. Now that winter is officially arriving, it's a good time to take another look at the nutrients in your wheat field. We begin today with SUNUP's Dave Deacon and our Extension Soil Nutrient Specialist, Brian Arnell. So Brian, what should producers be looking for in their fields right now? So right now I'm getting a lot of word from producers that some enriched strips are showing up in their fields. Uh, remember these enriched strips are areas of the field that have had 30 or 40 pounds of extra nitrogen applied in a small area. The fields that are showing up are fields that, that had a previous good harvest off of them or the producers only put a starter or no pre-plant nitrogen. So if you're out there you've got wheat or canola in the ground right now and it's growing well, take a look at the field. Um, if you didn't have any pre-plant down, start thinking about a top dress. And if we start talking about top dress, we have a couple options we want to think about. Uh, both urea and UAN, urea ammonium nitrate, are, are very popular top dress sources. If you're going to use urea, uh, pay attention to how you apply. You'd prefer to have urea down in front of a rain and get it rained in three or four days ahead. If the temperatures are cool uh, below 45 for several days, it's not going to be, uh, there's not going to be a possibility of a whole lot of losses. So cool temperature application or applying in front of a rainfall are ideal conditions when applying urea. If you want to use liquid, uh, UAN, whether that's 2800 or 3200, we have a couple methods we, we need to talk about. One is the traditional broadcast spraying when you're spraying a herbicide. So just a regular uh, uh, flat fan nozzle with a herbicide and applying it that way. That's a great method if you have plenty of wheat in the field, like, like the field next to us. We have good coverage of wheat. We're going to have plenty of that nitrogen getting on the wheat itself. It's a bad option, however, if you're in a no-till field and you have a lot of residue showing. You don't want a lot of your nitrogen hitting dead residue because there's good potential for it to be tied up. So if we have a field that has more than 30 percent, 25 or 30 percent residue showing, so only 70 percent canopy cover, we need to consider going to a streamer nozzle. Streamer nozzle is concentrating that, that liquid fertilizer into a stream. It gets it below that residue into the soil better. And in most cases, streamer nozzles are good options for top dress nitrogen with liquid. It does require an extra pass. So that pass will be paid for if you have a lot of residue because it will easily tie up that 10 pounds of nitrogen and residue that would take to pay for that extra pass of the rig using streamer nozzles. If producers have cattle in the field right now, they have a bonus en enriched strip walking out there right now. Absolutely, if you're starting to see the cowpox or those green spots start to show up, just remember they're equivalent to an enriched strip. That green area is saying that that part of the field is deficient in nitrogen. So if you see those cowpox showing up, you will make money by applying fertilizer because that's going to increase your forage production and increase your gain. Okay, now that's wheat. Let's talk about canola and, and, and what should producers be looking for in those fields? Same thing in canola right now. If you went fairly short with your pre-plant, mm -hmm. Start looking at the fields right now. Start thinking about top dress. Uh, start planning that out. Plan that application. If you're going to use dry in front of rainfall, uh, have those plans out. Now's a good time to start that planning and, and many are actually applying. Another thing to look at right now, this is a perfect time of year to start looking at your fields and spotting bad problems, problem areas. Canola is one of the best crops that we can look at because it's sensitive to pH, it's sensitive to phosphorus, it's sensitive to several several different things that can be going on in the environment. So look at your fields as a whole. Look for those bad spots and go out there and pull some soil samples or scout those areas and see what's causing this bad area, what's causing this poor stand growth, poor winter survivability, and look at dealing with that in the future. So it gives you a great opportunity to develop zones for pH, for phosphorus, potassium, or nitrogen going into next year, or even potentially dealing with it in the next coming weeks. You really wouldn't think that winter would be the time to, to really do an update on your soil. You know, it, it's not the time I would traditionally recommend mm -hmm. a soil sample, mm -hmm. but these plants, having a plant out there is the best litmus paper for what your soil conditions are. So if the crop's not doing good now, it's a time we can get out there, we can walk on it, the canola's not knee high, we can easily move through the field with trucks, with four wheelers, what be it, and get out there and take some samples. Okay, for more information on soil nutrition, you can go to a link on our website, sunup.okstate.edu. Have you 
ever wondered how Santa Claus and his reindeer make that very, very long journey every Christmas Eve? Well, the scientist in me indicated that I had to try to look some things up and see if I could better understand how this big journey actually takes place. First of all, I found that historians report that reindeer have been domesticated by man for over 5,000 years. <laughs> and we all know Santa Claus is no spring chicken himself. He's been around a long time. So I think we're pretty comfortable in the fact that he knows where he's going to go and they're not gonna get lost. You know, some people be concerned, how do those reindeer get through that entire evening and, and have enough to eat? Well, remember reindeer are just like cattle in some ways. They have four stomachs and they can store a lot of feed to utilize throughout that entire evening. Santa Claus knows that if the, he feeds those reindeer a good meal of something like hay or moss, that digests more slowly than something like grain. And you remember, just like your mother used to say, get a good breakfast so it'll stick to your ribs. Well, it's the same concept. This hay will stick around with those reindeer throughout the entire evening and provide them the energy that they need to fly around the world. How do they keep warm up there in the sky on a cold, cold winter's night? Well, remember reindeer, they're up there at the North Pole anyway. They have a very thick fur, traps a lot of little pieces of air in around the hair, and that provides a really warm blanket all over their body. So they're very, very comfortable on that cold winter night. Now you might be concerned about where there's reindeer if they get thirsty on the ride. Well, in their North Pole environment, you know, the water's all frozen anyway. So they're used to just getting a little mouthful of snow that'll take in and get the water that they need. And they're gonna get that off a rooftop if they get thirsty in warm climates. They can just stop by any little lake or pond and get a drink if necessary. So we don't need to worry about our reindeer that Santa Claus is using getting uh, too thirsty. Now, what about that part about how do reindeer fly? Boy, that's a tough one. But let's do some math, and I think we can figure this out. First of all, we know that reindeer can run very, very rapidly. When the researchers in Alaska do studies on reindeer, they found out that a baby reindeer, one day of age, can outrun the fastest graduate student that they've got. Well, if they're that fast at one day of age, just think how rapidly they can run when they're adults. So they can get up a lot of speed. Adult reindeer, they're different than our whitetail that we have here in Oklahoma. They have very long antlers. Uh, the antlers may reach as long as four feet. Well, think about this. They've got four feet of antlers on each side, so each reindeer has about an eight-foot antler span. That then multiplied by the fact that Santa Claus generally uses eight reindeer, eight times eight, that's 64 feet of antler span 72 if he uses Rudolph, and that is about twice as wide as the typical wingspan on a small plane that can fly at any time. So with all that speed and all that antler span, doesn't it make sense that they can certainly get off the ground? Well, you know, there's a couple of things that we ought to clear up. You've probably heard the song about up on the housetop, click, click, click. Well, reindeer do have a tendon that goes over their knee that when they walk, makes a clicking sound. But the part about them having tiny reindeer paws, that one's not correct. Reindeer have a large foot that helps them dig through the snow to get the moss, to help them as they land on these roof, have a real, real big surface to land on so that they can stop in that short area. Hey, I think that from what we found about uh, reindeer, that they're going to make that uh, trip very, very well this year. And for me, I tell you what, I'm going to be good between now and Christmas because I want to make sure that Santa Claus and those reindeer stop at my house this year. And we look forward to visiting with you next time on Sunup's Cow Calf Corner. International trade is an important part of the livestock market, and in North America, live cattle trade is a key part. Joining us now, Daryl Peel, our livestock marketing specialist. And Daryl, give us the situation of what the trade looks like with live cattle in, in Canada right now. 
You know, on average, we get from Canada about a million head a year, varies uh, up and down. That's a mixture of feeder cattle, slaughter cattle, and some slaughter cows and bulls that come into the U.S. Key thing this year, uh, imports are up about 20% from Canada, and, and that includes about a 42% increase in feeder cattle supplies or feeder cattle imports from Canada this year. And then let's head south and get a picture of what things are like with Mexico. You know, in terms of Mexican cattle that come up, they're all feeder cattle. Um, sometimes they go to grazing programs, occasionally they go straight into feedlots. Those, are, those imports will be up in 2014 about 12 to 13 percent over 2013 levels. 2013 was down about 30 percent from the previous year where Mexico was experiencing drought liquidation in 2012. And then in terms of the overall U.S. picture and, and the takeaway of how it impacts the U.S. market? Two things are important about this in terms of the U.S. One is these feeder cattle imports supplement our declining feeder cattle supplies in the U.S. And so it's one way the market tries to compensate for tight cattle numbers in the U.S. Uh, the other one is that there's a limit to how much this can happen and more importantly, what might happen in the next few years. The Canadian imports this year, about 95% of the year over year increase in feeder cattle imports are heifers. Uh, proportionately more of the Mexican cattle imports are heifers. So we've been talking about herd expansion probably starting in 2014 in the U.S. It's pretty clear at this point that it's not happening yet in Canada and Mexico, and that's going to keep their numbers really tight. Okay, Daryl Peel, great perspective. Thanks a lot. Hi, I'm Al Sutherland with your Mesonet Weather Report. As the year edges closer to an end, we continue to find ourselves behind on rain. A map of rainfall as a percent of normal from January 1st through mid-December has most of the state colored yellow between 60 and 80 percent of normal rainfall. The olive green areas were between 80 to 100 percent of normal rainfall. If we looked at our rainfall in inches below normal, the bright red areas were more than 12 inches behind from January 1st to mid-December. Bright orange areas were 8 to 12 inches short. Light orange areas were 6 to 8 inches behind normal. Yellow areas were 3 to 6 inches short on rainfall. For Oklahoma, the U.S. Drought Monitor map for December 16th had it all. Oklahoma had non-drought areas in eastern Oklahoma colored white and every level of drought designation within our borders. The dark burgundy areas in southwest Oklahoma and the northern half of Ellis County continued as D4 exceptional drought areas. The red areas were D3 extreme drought, the brown areas were D2 severe drought, most of these are in the western third of the state with one small area covering parts of Osage, Pawnee, and Creek counties. Tan areas were rated as D1 moderate drought. At the lowest drought designation were the yellow areas rated as D0 abnormally dry. Wednesday afternoon was a time on the edge across Oklahoma. We were on the edge of freezing temperatures that were edging in from the north. At 5.25 p.m. on Wednesday, only one mesonet site was at 40 degrees, Goodwell in the Panhandle. For the rest of the state, air temperatures were in the 30s. Wednesday, we were also on the edge of darkness. Sunlight levels at 4.35 were extremely low from the dark, low-level clouds. Cimarron County in the western Panhandle was the only area with the full sun late Wednesday afternoon. The rest of the state was extremely overcast, with sunlight levels in watts per meter squared, ranging from 1 to the low 20s. We were right on the edge of getting some needed rain, only to see it move through really quickly. As of 8 p.m. Wednesday evening, all mesonet sites came in under 1 inch of rain, and the areas with the highest drought designations were less than a tenth of an inch or had no rain at all. Cattle were at the edge of their comfort range, with many cattle comfort index values ranging from the low 20s to the upper teens, the blue map areas. For relative humidity, we went over the edge, with the majority of sites in the bright blue areas coming in between 97 and 100 percent late Wednesday afternoon. From all of us on the Oklahoma Mesonet team, we wish you and your family a very Merry Christmas and the best in 2015. We're asking Santa for more rain, mild temps, and light winds for Oklahoma's people, crops, and livestock this coming year. 
Thanks for joining us for this edition of the Mesonet Weather Report. Kim Anderson, our crop marketing specialist, joins us now. And Kim, Santa arrived early for Oklahoma wheat producers this week. And I think it surprised about everybody. You know, we were talking about that that price wallowing around 620. If it had just go above 620, it went up to 666, went back down to 620, and now we're up near seven dollars. And uh, that's been a surprise to us. And what do you think are some of the factors behind this price rally? Well, I think we can go through the, the uh, usual uh, guilty pre people, you know, Russia with uh, their potential problems of quality and, and uh, restricting exports. you got the European Union with a quality problem with their harvest. You've got Australia with a, a smaller harvest, slightly smaller than we anticipated. you got Argentina with uh, policy restrictions on their, on their wheat exports. Uh, then you got Cuba this last week, uh, some potential uh, exports to Cuba. They're all excited about that. And then, of course, the United States with our below average stocks and uh, below average yields last year. $7 wheat making a lot of people smile. Do you think it can last? Uh, that, uh, well, I just have to wait and find out. Well, you know, we talked about but on before Thanksgiving, we were going into the holiday seasons that that uh, you could have some uh, moves that would be unexpected. Uh, we really won't know what this market's going to do until we get after gen through January 2nd and we get a little more volume, a little more participation in the market. Right now, I think what's causing the big price moves is the funds moved that their, their uh, capital, their money out of livestock and they put it into corn and wheat. Uh, they went from net short in wheat to net long and I think that's a big, big reason for the move right there. With all this in mind, a word of advice for producers. I think it's time to take advantage of some of this. Uh, you look at the harvest price, you can buy a, a put, uh, say a 640 or $6.50 put for uh, 30 or 40 cents. You can lock in a minimum price of $6.610. I think that's real good. You can forward contract wheat right now for $6.50 for harvest delivery. I think as we get into harvest, especially if we have production, that's going to be a good price. Okay, Kim, thanks a lot and happy holidays. Merry Christmas to you. And now a word from Tom Kuhn, our Vice President, Dean and Director. On behalf of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, it's a pleasure and an honor for me to wish you and your families a happy holiday season. My wife Rhonda and I and our sons are especially grateful for the tremendous welcome that we've received across the state and we hope to extend that and return the, uh, the grace of that uh, blessing to many of you in the year ahead. This is a wonderful time of year to celebrate the graduation of 1,200 new graduates from Oklahoma State University and we know we'll have even more coming out in the spring semester. We wish them all uh, successful beginnings to their careers wherever they may take them and we wish you all a happy and prosperous new year. As the year winds down, so does the centennial celebration for the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service and what a year it has been. We started back in January at our annual meeting where we bring all the people in and focused on the history of the land grant system and, and of course we were the last member to join the land grant system for teaching first research and then extension. At the end of our meeting we had a little uh, happy birthday party with Pistol Pete there and a cake and all of that to celebrate our 100th birthday and then had the opportunity to do a one hour video for OETA on the history of uh, extension in Oklahoma and, and that was quite interesting to do and and one of the things in doing that research that we learned was that in the early days of extension, the delivery method that was used, one of the common ones, was to put exhibits and people on a train and travel across the state. And some of those trains reached 50,000 people. Um, so we reenacted that with our own whistle stop event uh, down in Lincoln County. We moved on from that and um, did a little display at one of our football games, which we uh, showed the triangle and our logo and talked a little bit on the PA and the big screen about extension. Well, it's been very enjoyable for me and I think a great success for not only Extension, but the people of Oklahoma. It was a pleasure this year to also witness the centennial quilt unfold. So today we want to take a glimpse at some of the effort and creativity that went into making an Extension showpiece. Inside this farmhouse, 15 miles west of Fairview, Oklahoma, have been a farm girl all my life. Charlotte Tucker uses her long arm machine to custom quilt blocks that come along once in a lifetime. 
once in a century, in fact, to mark 100 years of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service. A 4-H'er as a child, Charlotte entered sewing projects in the county fair. My grandmother used to sit in a rocking chair quilting and that always fascinated me. She changes the thread often and gauges each individual block with her creative eye. It, it has to be out in front of me and then it starts talking to me. The results are breathtaking. Charlotte's quilting stands on its own, yet humbly showcases the block itself. All the work that's involved in it, uh, how it talked to me, uh, not to rob the beauty from the piecer. That, I feel like that's the quilter's job, is to make the piecer shine. The blocks are from the Centennial Quilt Block Challenge that Risa Garcia helped organize. 152 quilt blocks from three states arrived in my personal mailbox in Woodward, Oklahoma, and that was so much fun because every day when I would open the mail, I would get out my camera and take pictures and and uh, say, look what came today. The team then narrowed it down to 42. Looking at the 152 in no particular order, but to give me their input on what they thought best represented the extension story. The contest also had online voting. Nearly 24,000 hits. Looking at this and over 3,000 votes, and we really utilize social media there again to get out the awareness. One lady, um, I believe she'd be proud for me to say that she won the hand pieced category. That lady is Marie Davis of Dewey in Washington County. Well, my mother taught us to quilt when we was children. She always had a quilt up in the house, year round almost, and uh, she would let us quilt. Now, I don't know how good my stitches was, but she never did say anything, so I guess it was okay. <laughs> Busy raising a family, Marie didn't quilt for decades until 1993 at the encouragement of one of her sons. She wasn't sure she could even still do it. But I made it and won second prize at the fair on it. <laughs> so that's what started me quilting again. She's made dozens of beautiful quilts since. And when she heard about the contest... I just thought that it'd be fun. Well, my block is the road to Oklahoma. I thought that was fitting for the occasion. And uh, it's an old, old quilt pattern. Likely older than the sewing machine she's had for 65 years, Marie entered her block and thought that was the end of it until sitting at her laptop one day reading an email with her granddaughter. I couldn't believe my eyes when I looked at it, so it made me real happy. A first place ribbon in the hand pieced category. She became a social media sensation for the online part of the contest. Word spread of the 94-year-old great-great-grandmother's great quilt block. Well, I put it on Facebook, and all my friends told their friends about it. Made me proud that they thought that much of me to vote for me. Second place out of 152 blocks for online viewers' choice and another ribbon. We were on a pretty good race. But more important than ribbons and recognition, Marie's pure joy of being a part of it all. Well, it's just been a wonderful experience. Just all the love that poured in. Blocks from the heart. And when they're connected, a quilt that stands as a symbol of Extension's enduring contribution, linking homes, farms, and most important, families across Oklahoma and beyond for a century. Finally today, our holiday gift to you, OSU President Burns Hargis reading the sun-up version of a classic holiday poem. We like to call it A Cowboy Christmas. Tis the night before Christmas and all through the land Farmers are toiling with well-worn tools in hand. The cattle are fed, the horses well tended, the show lambs are pampered as if they were kindred. The children are sleeping beside the show box. The ribbons they dream of are surely now locks. And mama with her city job and I with mine too are finally home, but still with plenty to do. The bawling calves require vaccination Blister beetles in the alfalfa need extermination. The markets must be checked so the wheat can be sold. 
and parts must be ordered because this deer's getting old. Still the clock moves forward and this all must wait. St. Nicholas and my children have a firm date. The kids long for toys, electronics, and candy. My wife deserves jewelry or a beach that's quite sandy. But for me, all I need is rain, except when I don't. Grain prices that peak and gas prices that won't. I need happy calves with strong immunity and for powerful storms to miss our community. But in the end, no, I have no complaints. I'm surrounded by those who lift my constraints. A veterinarian who even at night takes my call. My extension educator beside me with answers for the long haul. My banker is patient, my insurance agent wise. Not sure what I'd do without those guys. But I know I'd be here on this piece of land, fighting for everything my heart finds so grand. My wife, my kids, my dirt, and this sky, that is quite enough for this guy. So in this season of joy and wonder and light, let me just say, Merry Christmas to all, and to all, a good night. That'll do it for us this week. Remember, you can find us anytime at sunup.okstate.edu, and also follow us on YouTube and social media. I'm Lyndall Stout, Happy holidays. We'll see you next time at SUNUP.